According to psychiatrist and author Eric Fromm, the reality of this world is simply different for the present young generation. It's discontinuous, it's unstructured, its meaning is just not inherited as it was for earlier generations. In the following interview with freelance broadcaster Eleanor Fisher, Dr. Fromm criticizes today's new left, both for not taking past and future seriously and for not being revolutionary enough. Here's their conversation. How do you view the new left movement? In the first place, I believe that the new left expresses a very genuine feeling of deep dissatisfaction of the young and thoughtful and feelingful generation against the boredom, emptiness, deadliness of the life of present-day society. And they express also some kind of a vision of and hope for a society which is centered around man, his unfolding, his happiness, his aliveness, rather than on machines, on human relations rather than on bureaucracy, on processes rather than on things. Um, and in this respect, I deeply sympathize with the ideas of the new left. In fact, they have been ideas I have believed in for the last, uh, what would it be, 50 years or so. Uh, however, uh, there is one peculiar phenomenon which has been, of course, commented on by many people, and that is that the new left seems to be little given to objective uh, analysis of the existing forces. Uh, perhaps I could mention one point here which seems important to me. It seems that a large part of our young generation lives by experiences of kicks and thrills which have no structure. Perhaps I could explain it with an example. You find some modern painters who, in a state of great excitement, throw color or brush with a big brush, paint color on a canvas. And they call it art because it has been done in a state of high emotionality. Mm -hmm. But actually, it has no structure. And you find the same thing in some uh, expressions, manifestations of modern music or even modern poetry. It has no structure, but it is nothing but a moment of kick, a moment of excitement which in itself is genuine. But every deep experience has structure, must have structure. Structure within oneself, structure within the sense of the individual being related to his society, structure in the sense of continuity from the past to the future. The young generation has often the feeling or conveys the feeling that they have no use for the past, but they also have no vision of the future. It seems that they are satisfied with the unstructured element of the moment, with the electric shock, which either a shout or a yell or a moment of excitement gives, or a drug, or any of the, many, of the many forms in which a person can experience excitement per se. But unstructured excitement is really not part of life. It is basically dead, because all that is life is structured. Now, I'm, uh, I know this is uh, saying something about a very complex phenomenon in very simple words, I meant to <coughs> emphasize that it seems to me that the new left shares very often this unstructured form of experiences with many other phenomena of contemporary culture which often are politically not radical at all. Can you elaborate on this? 
Well, I could elaborate perhaps by adding one thing. What has happened to us is that a unified continuum of the world, which existed still after the end of the Middle Ages, is breaking up. The world is not anymore a house or a ship or something which has its known frame of reference. It is in some way losing its structure because there are so many and ever in rapidly, more rapidly increasing changes in technique, in outlook, in knowledge, in possibilities of changes in human beings, that basically the individual loses the security of a frame of reference which gives him the feeling of a unity to which he can refer to an entity which has a certain frame of reference to which he can refer. Now the older generation pretends that the ship is sailing nicely and it sticks to its old cliches and ideas and the criticism of the new generation is that they are all non-authentic, that they are just cliches, that, they, that <clears throat> the practice of life is something entirely different from the meaning, from the experience which these things have. And they would rightly say, these people believe that they are sailing in the ocean on a nice liner and they are not aware of the fact that this liner is sinking fast. Now, I would say the young generation does the opposite. They have given up the idea that there is any structure, any ship, that a new ship could be constructed. And they live only from, in terms of the exciting moment. And I think that <coughs> also, while exciting, is not promising for the future, because behind that is basically a deep resignation. What is this resignation? I wish you would... Um, well, I think there is a great deal of despair, of suffering, of fury behind it, and a tragic crying for something, tragic cry for life of people who, at the same time, do not see sufficiently a way to, to change life. Let me give an example, perhaps. The beards. Well, the beards are an expression of protest and a certain kind of dress. After a short time, they become a convention themselves. So, a person who wears a beard and dresses in a certain way is stamped as a radical for himself, just as a man who goes to church is stamped as a pious man for himself. It is not required, he is not put to the test how much he really changes, how serious how deep his new conviction really is, or whether there is any new conviction aside from that which is in his, in his, uh, in his head? head. I would suggest, for instance, that if those who really are serious would, uh, that those could do something quite different, not beards, but be so concentrated on the new the, on the new attitudes, new human attitudes, new human relatedness, um, that they look different for anyone who looks at them, that their posture is different, that their language is different, that they do not antagonize people simply because of the newness and strangeness of their outer outer appearances. It's being free, isn't this what the whole concept of doing your thing is about? Yes, but it's a, it's in many ways a childish way of being free. Uh, it's a, the real problem is uh, how can you acquire that independence and freedom and show it in yourself and demonstrate it to people? 
by your attitude. That's not the attitude of hate. That's the attitude of great independence, of great courage, of sober reasoning. Compare, for instance, what the Czechs and the Russian uh, leftists do in their fight against Soviet conservatism and reaction. Uh, they are utterly objective. They do not argue from hate. They are realistic. They see what the situation is, but they show tremendous moral courage. They are impressive. They do not unnecessarily antagonize people because they know that if there's any chance for a change, they must carry with them a large amount or at least a considerable amount of public opinion. Therefore, they cannot afford just to antagonize, but uh, they can afford and must afford to show that they are different. Let me throw this out at you. The young people of the new, new left, particularly uh, those who are perhaps on the extreme of this movement, um, claim that they are revolutionary. And that to make a revolution, you don't first educate the majority to want the, re the revolution. A revolution can be made with a minority. Therefore, it is not necessarily important whether you antagonize over small things like beers and clubs. Well, what, um, all this problem has been discussed very thoroughly by two great revolutionaries, by, uh, well, uh, one great revolutionary, by Lenin, in from 1917 on until the early 20s um, and Lenin would uh, have called this just adventurism and phrase making of course it was the idea of Marx it was the idea of Lenin that you can make a revolution only if it's not a putsch if you have behind you if not the actual majority of the population but potentially the majority of the population. If this majority will be behind you tomorrow, the idea which then later was developed by Stalin, namely revolution by terror, was an idea which is, of course, uh, in contrast to Marx's idea of revolution. It is in contrast to the original ideas of Lenin, who started his revolution because he was convinced that Germany would have a revolution, and then this German-Russian revolution would really have a majority of the population behind it and would be a viable socialist society. But to um, consider a revolution uh, in which uh, one assumes that uh, a small percentage of the blacks and a small percentage of the students will overthrow and conquer the um, uh, un government of the United States is just childish and, uh, let us say, Marcuse, as far as I can see, also says that uh, this is not possible. The idea that uh, one can make a revolution when the majority of people are against one is just uh, uh, at best romantic, unreasoned, unrealistic. It doesn't make any sense <clears throat> and leads only to strengthening of the military or fascist forces in a country. I should like, however, to make the footnote that I think most of the new left uh, do not want to make a revolution. Uh, I think uh, that most of them are sufficiently intelligent to know that there is no possibility. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, Marcuse is a spokesman for many who really does not believe in the possibility of a revolution. It seems, however, that they do not have any alternative. That is to say, they see there is no possibility for a revolution, but they do not see what else could be done to prevent the drift of our technological society into either war, nuclear war, or into the complete technotronic society, to use a word by Professor Brzezinski, 
in which man becomes entirely a cog of the machine without feeling, without individuality, without conviction, without even any thinking beyond that which is necessary for the routine of performing a job. <clears throat> and this is indeed the difference between my own position and that of many of the new left. Uh, in many ways, my own aims are not very different from what many of the new left have expressed, namely the aim of a participatory democracy, of a tremendous activation of the citizen, in, participation, in his participation in the political process, in the industrial process, in every enterprise in which he is employed. Um, in other words, I believe that we must change our bureaucratic pattern in which the individual is irresponsible because he has no responsibility, because our whole system is a bureaucratic one which does not give the individual responsibility, that this needs to be changed. Furthermore, that our pattern of consumption needs to be changed, that the force feeding of the individual with commodities, which leads to this passiveness, must be changed, and that means the pattern of production must be changed. Um, that means that uh, investments must be made in the public sector and that high ta and uh, the only way to do that is high taxation, which would enforce much less, um, much less uh, consumption in the private sector. The, but all these questions are questions which I never uh, uh, discussed. I try to uh, discuss in the book, for instance, the question that our whole economic scheme is ever increasing production. The idea that at one point one could stabilize production doesn't even occur. Now, it's perfectly true, even in a rich country like the United States, we don't produce enough for about 40% of the population, but we produce too much for about another 40% of the population. We waste. We must begin to discuss the question. Can we visualize uh, the economy in which there is a limit, a ceiling to the increase of production, and then it means that our sense of hope, of future, of happiness is not anymore the chasing after the idea or the dream of ever increasing consumption. But in addition, I believe that all these things will not help unless we are aware that in order to live um, productively, one must have aims and values, and to come to grips with what the individual really aims at, what his values are. Indignation and protests are in themselves very valuable but they are not enough. It's also not enough to be young. Um, and I believe that what the, at the point of our present historical development, we have lost almost completely the continuity with the humanist past, which has made Western society a viable society for 3,000 years. Uh, all the values which this past um, has created in the West as until some time ago it has created them also in India and in China for many thousands of years. All this past is in danger to be completely lost in the sense that it is only consumed as culture. It's taught in schools and is just as passively received as cigarettes or any other form of consumption. The question is, can these values become relevant again? And this indeed requires that one goes beyond the phrase-making, that one goes beyond the purely political, although the politics is very necessary, and that one analyzes the existence of the whole man and his need 
to have goals and aims and values and to ask oneself, which are the values and goals which one is pursuing and which is a relevance of the humanist tradition for today? Dr. Fehr, may I stop you here for a minute? How are you going to go about convincing the worker, for example, that to strike for a second car in his garage is not necessarily the fulfillment of his existence as a human being. How are you going to convince people who are positive that they are living in the freest country in the world, let's say, and are the greatest examples of free men, that they are in fact not free? Well, uh, this is a very good question, um, and being confronted with it could make one simply hopeless because the answer is extremely difficult. Uh, we have this uh, paradoxical situation that quite in contrast to Marx's prediction, the working class in America is by no means a progressive class, but one of the most conservative, if not reactionary classes. Um, and uh, we see, in fact, that we have seen that in the McCarthy movement, for instance, and we see it among some of the leaders of the radical left that, in fact, the affluent part of, this, of American society is the most critical one because they have already experienced that another car doesn't make them happy, that more consumption doesn't make them happy. You can see that quite consciously in many of the young radicals who large part of them come from middle class or upper middle class families, and you can see it among their parents too. Uh, those who are below this level still believe, and who can afford only a second hand car, still believe that happiness lies in the two cars and in the better cars and in this and in that. They are caught in the system which seduces them every day into feeling that more consumption is the aim of all life. Now, the question is, what weight the, that sector of American society, which is aware of the emptiness of this kind of life, what weight it will have in at least influencing the process of uh, in a direction which is conducive to changing the pattern. The question is really the most acute one in the upper half of the society and not in those who are still struggling for uh, material benefits or material, material benefits goods? and don't have enough nor do they have the comforts, psychological, spiritual, human pleasures and interests which make life meaningful. Well, then is it now, is it your feeling that it is up to the um, well-educated classes who are aware of the mirage that most people are living in to educate people to understand uh, the nature of life, the attitudes they should have towards work? And if so, how and through what means, considering the fact that the power structure itself, all the mechanisms that keep this ideology in place, have a stake in its perpetuation? You will find that everybody has a stake also in survival. Everybody has a stake also, the advertisers too, and the business executive too, executive too, executives too, has a stake in, in peace. Uh, and they have a stake also in a saner form of living. This is not such a closed front. This is not such a closed door. Um, they see their own children. They see their children stealing at the age of eight. They see their children taking drugs. They see their children bored. They see a tremendous amount of violence, bitterness, aggressiveness around the world. They are human. All of us are. So this is not... Uh, the peculiar situation is today that not just one economic or social class is threatened. The whole population is threatened. The more thoughtful ones know it, and the less thoughtful ones don't know it, and therefore many of them think that some demagogue will, will save them. But that is an illusion. 
I cannot answer your question if I could, in a satisfactory way. If I could, I would be one of the happiest persons in in America. I'm looking for the, the basis for optimism. Well, this is a crazy society. I think the question is not whether we are healthy or not, whether, but whether we suffer from a curable or an incurable sickness. That is to say, whether we have a chance to save ourselves and to survive or whether we have not. There are many people today who are convinced the chance is gone. There are many people and many thoughtful people, not so many, perhaps, but a few, but what they lack in numbers, they have in quality and depth of thinking. I'm not referring to myself, but to uh, people like Elul, Jacques Elul or Louis Mumford and some others who don't think everything is lost, but who are very skeptical about the possibility. Perhaps I could put it in an example. If two people play chess, one has made one mistake, a second mistake, a third mistake, and there comes a point where he can still win, but it is not very likely, but he still can. But there comes one point more if he made another mistake where it is impossible for him to win. At this point, the chess master knows he has lost and he gives up. While the one who is not a very good chess player goes on to the bitter end because he doesn't understand that the game is lost before his king is really checkmated. Now, our question, it seems to me, is have we still a chance to make moves and at least a chance for a draw or have we already lost and only are too blind to see the forces at work? What is your opinion on this? I uh, feel to be in a very similar position as Elul and Louis Mumford, perhaps a little bit more hopeful for certain reasons. And that's still my position. I have not given up hope. I still believe there is a chance for a holding action, at least, which might permit us to, ov to overcome the threat to our physical and psychic existence. I do believe, however, if, we, if nothing happens in a new direction the next few years, then I would be rather without hope. Dr. Eric Frum, author of The Art of Loving, Escape from Freedom, and most recently, Revolution of Hope, talking to Eleanor Fisher about revolution as he desires it and as the young see it.